Ages in childhood when we get there, I do want to talk to you about a few prayer requests and I want to read something to you. Is this hot? No. Okay. You, the Sakura said no. Okay, it's not hot. Do you want me to put on the fries with that? There you go. All right. So let me read you something first. A lot, a lot of, uh, I, I posted this yesterday, but I know not everybody has access to Facebook and I'm probably going to read it during the announcements as well. If, if I feel like there's time, but just bear me out. Uh, as usual, when you print something off the internet, it cut off the edges. So I may not get it exactly right, but I'm the author. So I have my permission to mess it up a little. Okay. I have heard people say of various churches, this church has a great pastor. Well, let me just say that this pastor has a great church. I can't explain the joy of seeing Christians act like, well, act like Christians. That is to follow Christ closely enough to be called a Christian, which signifies they are so Christ-like to warrant the title little Christs. The Bible says of Jesus, who had willfully laid aside his glory to come to earth, that he increased in, uh, I see, I can't see that, and I want to quote it exactly. So let me get my Bible here. He increased in wisdom and stature before God and men, I believe, God and man. He increased in in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. That's what it says. Now, Jesus neither had nor has a sin nature to conquer, but he did face every temptation that we face. And he did have to grow. And that's what the saints at Heritage are doing right now. Increasing in wisdom and in favor with God and men. I cannot see it all, and it's going to sound stupid, but basically I can't tell you the joy of watching a congregation hunger to know God, which precipitates a teachable spirit. That teachable spirit is displayed by almost daily texts and emails and phone calls uh, of saints with questions about God and his word. And these are not in any way argumentative. Rather, they display a true hunger to grow in wisdom. That joy is augmented exponentially by watching members confidentially speak with me about some temptation or even some failure, uh, seemingly already in the midst of repentance, they seek both counsel and accountability. And it's an even greater joy to see them then move on by God's grace from victory to victory. Then there is the fellowship. Folks stay after church to fellowships, sometimes literally hours. Folks are quick to help one another. They are truly walking in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship one with another. That's from 1 John 1, 7. Glory be to God the Father and through his Son, my Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of his Spirit, this pastor has a great church. Can you praise and honor God with me? He is certainly working in the midst of Heritage Baptist in the KMC. So that is my praise for the day. I will try to get somebody's phone and try to read that a little more clearly in the 11 o'clock. But prayer requests, um, I couldn't get things to work well. That's why I only printed out the email and not the exact text this morning. But So I didn't print out our big five-page list. But I know pressingly, uh, Lon is home, John has fallen. I know in a pressing manner, um, uh, Mark and Rose, Mark has returned from his undisclosed location uh, very ill. He does not have COVID, but something like what I had with the bad cough and all of that, and so does Rose. So they are home tonight, uh, today. Uh, kind of like I was at my house. I was on, in an extra room. He's on the couch because the cough is so bad it disturbs your partner, you know. But anyway, let's play, pray for them. And then Shannon, which is 
Chamberlain's mother, uh, her blood pressure is better, but she's not out of the woods yet. So let's pray for that. Anybody got something pressing they want to add? Yes, Miss Lauren. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Maybe that's in our favor. Maybe we should not pray that because we don't want to see you go, right? Well, I mean, our, our stuff needs to stay. So, <laughs> so you want to go because all your stuff is gone. Okay. So let's pray for this uh, unusual situation. I can switch. Just turn it off because that bop, bop, bop is bugging me. No, Yeah. I'm sure it's bugging everybody else. Uh, yes, Mike, I saw your hand. I combed my hair. You're going to mess up my hair. Yes, I'm listening. Right. Cancer. You, you got to go see him, did you not? Okay, tell me the, the name one more time. John Is that P-A-N-N-E-L-L -L or B-A? Oh, F. Funnel. F-A-N-N-E-L-L? -L? I didn't butcher it too bad. I would call that fennel. But anyway, everybody gets to pronounce their own name the way they want to. I had some friends whose name was Tunnel, but they called themselves Tunnel, amen. So that's just the way it goes. Uh, the Fennel the Fennel family. Amen. So that's my mother-in-law, Carol. Gout in her not dominant hand, but still bad, and other joints in the body. And uh, the macular de degeneration, she, she was one of the test patients for the shots they put in your eye. Uh, she's been doing that for like more than a decade. I really can't remember how long she's been doing it. But now that they've conquered the dry... The, the uh, excuse me, the wet, the dry is set in. I actually have other relatives that are benefiting from her being a guinea pig for this one. My uh, nearly 80 year old aunt in Alabama is taking the same wet treatment, but now they're doing the dry treatment. And anyway, we're just trying to keep her to be able to see enough to get around. She is legally blind. She ceased to drive some years ago, but she does live alone, amen. So she needs to be able to see a little bit, okay? We have other people that go in and clean out the fridge so she doesn't accidentally eat something that's out of date, that kind of stuff. But anyway, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I leave that Sunday and I'm gone for about a month. Oh. And, uh, several locations have been closed and yeah. Okay. Like before when you gotta go here for a few days and there for a few days and So today is the 14th, I thought it was. So you're leaving on the 21st, and then you'll be back after Valentine's Day? Uh, around the 17th, I believe. Yes. Well, Shane, do you get to go with her? He's going to try to go to, uh, to one portion of it. But not the underway, they're not going to let you. <laughs> Okay, well, let's pray for Darla as she travels. I'm sure the underway will be kind of cool, but anyway. 
All right, anybody else? Yes, Joe. Uh, uh, and can find to be a good result, including at my wake up no later at all than when I get out of the recovery room, John Tan. Okay. So Joe has another surgery to redo the first surgery he had some months ago. Uh, it is a personal thing, so I can't tell you what the surgery is, but he wants me to read John 10. This is a tradition he's had for probably 40 years. Anytime they put him to sleep, he wants to wake up here in John 10. Uh, but the last time they wouldn't let me in to the recovery room. And so it was some hours after the surgery. So he's kind of stressing about me being able to read John 10 to him and that the surgery goes well. And it's not a very pleasant surgery. I'll leave it at that. And it, the last one was unsuccessful. So we do want to pray that this one is successful. Okay, anybody else? Glad to have Josh back with us for a few days. Anybody else? Well, I'm gonna ask Josh to open us in a word of prayer. Lord, bless it. <clears throat> seem uh, that it, it seems almost impossible for men, but Lord, we know that through you all things are possible, and we just put these in your hand, and, and just pray that you would uh, put your uh, loving hands on them. Lord, I pray that you be with uh, Brother John as he brings the Sunday school message, and eventually the, uh, the Sunday uh, morning message, Lord, that you would hide him behind the cross, let it be your words, Lord, that we need to hear, and not uh, not his words, but you speaking to us. And we love you, Lord, and we praise you in your name. Amen. Amen. So, Anthony and Lauren, when we break from this class, I need to ask you two a quick question. Uh, it's not uh, anything like drastically private or, or, or heavily serious, but it's something I need to know before I make an announcement, okay? So, don't forget, everybody turn to Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, and Ephesians 6. Don't forget Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, and uh, Ephesians 6. Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, and Ephesians 6. So, so two don't forget, Lauren and, and Anthony are scheduled to leave with their girls, of course. You could leave the little horsey with us. We won't complain. Um, they are scheduled to leave with their girls on... Uh, the 25th, right? Which, so that is the, the, a Thursday coming up here in just a little while. And, um, Katie and Maiko, uh, Maiko was saved here, baptized here. Uh, Katie, uh, and Maiko are leaving, uh, sometime in February, I forget the exact date, but the, the reminder is there's a little plaque in the four year. So far, I think Denise, myself, and maybe Emma and Jeremy have signed one and just the, the three Hallmans on the other one. So give that a sign if you would. <clears throat> the other thing is February 16th, which I know is two days after uh, Valentine's, February 16th, uh, the youth is going to put on a Valentine's uh, banquet. Now, it's going to be simple because it's going to be here in the fellowship hall. If you uh, have youth uh, or kids in Miss Bree's class, uh, there will be no cost to that. If you do not have youth in, in one of those classes and you want to come, uh, I don't know if you can afford it. It's going to be five euro or five dollars. That's not even per person. That's per couple. Okay. So what? You cannot adopt Nathan for a day. He's mine. Amen. There's even a song to that effect. Okay. So I think that's all for right now. Oh, one more thing. Since I have parents in the room. 
There are some toys and a little table that were donated some months ago. They are still in the fellowship hall. If you know some place that you would like to donate those, have at it. If they are there at two o'clock, preacher's gonna donate them to someplace undisclosed, okay? Now, Exodus chapter 20, let's read. <clears throat> we're gonna start uh, with verse 12 which the New Testament tells us accurately is the first commandment with promise. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 5. I did not, okay, it's verse 16. Verse 16 in Deuteronomy chapter 5. So, m m Exodus is at the beginning of the journey. Deuteronomy is just before their entry. And these, uh, Deuteronomy, if you're not aware, this is kind of like Moses' last will and testament, okay? He's fixing to check out. He dishonored the Lord. He disobeyed the Lord. He did not lose his salvation, contrary to some people would have us believe. But he was not allowed to go into this victory because of his uh, sin against the Lord. The Lord told him to strike the rock, and he struck the rock, and he gave water. Boom. The Lord told him to speak to the rock. Now, that would be a perfect picture of um, salvation because Christ was beaten. He was uh, bruised for our iniquities, right? And then all we have to do today is ask him to save us, ask him to be our Lord. That's all we have to do for salvation. But Moses was mad you know, God's people, I know y'all can't believe this because y'all are so sweet, but God's people can really make people mad sometimes, okay? And they were murmuring and they were complaining. And in his anger, he didn't do what God told him to do. And he messed up God's picture. And God said, you know what? I still love you, but you're coming home. You can't go over there. So this is his last will and testament. And in that, he repeats the commandments. So in verse 16, get my glasses back again. It says, honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee that thy days may be prolonged and that it may, may go well with thee. Notice that phrase, it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now I want you to turn all the way to the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to turn to one more. Okay, Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to read uh, verses uh, 1 to 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, or because this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be, here's the phrase again, may be well with thee, and that and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers... Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now, one more time, look at Colossians in chapter number 3, and we're going to go ahead and start with verse 17 and read down to, um, we'll just read to the end of the chapter. It's not that many verses. I'll give you a second to get there. Colossians 3, we're going to start in verse 17. Okay, I don't hear any pages. Here we go. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, that's a couple, couplet that I keep telling you about in the New Testament, word and deed. It's important that we speak right, but it's also important that our walk exemplifies our talk, that what we tell people about the Lord, we're actually living that out, okay? Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband. So you don't have to listen. Darla doesn't have to listen to, to, to Nick, Nick and, and Bailey doesn't have to listen to Shane. Wives, your own husbands. Husbands, 
Love your wives and be not bitter against them. Well, we need a little preaching on the second part of that verse because husbands and wives are different. They think differently. And often, now I'm sure nobody in this room is guilty, but often men get bitter because of the differences that attracted them to their wife. Okay? So be not bitter against them. They are different. They think different than you do. Verse 20, children, obey your parents in all things. For this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers. We've all worked with that guy who won't hit a lick at a snake unless the, the, the NCOIC or the officer is there. And then, boy, he looks like he's the hardest worker, but he's really a bum, right? Jesus said, don't do that. Don't do it with eye service, but in singleness of heart. Why? The, the master is not in control. God is fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily. That's with all your strength. As to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive reward, the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Okay. Can you go put that can you go put that picture up for me? Is that turned on? Yes, sir. Okay. So <clears throat> when we when we're trying to teach a child to obey, by the way, with the current, what shall we say, vogue psychology, if you demand obedience of your children according to the powers that be, you warrant being watched because you're probably a child abuser. Okay? That is the most ludicrous thing I have heard in some times, but that's the truth. But honestly, that it may go well with thee. When children honor their parents, I don't think we need to turn it off. When children honor their parents, when they obey their parents, things go well. They have a long life. So really, when they're obeying, they are in kind of the circle of protection. And when they disobey, and they're out here, then they're outside. Things are probably not going to go well in disobedience. They're, they're, they, they may not live long if they're disobedient. Disobedient, okay? Help me, Lord. I'm trying not to get ahead of myself. I want to talk. Just leave that up there. I'm, I'm done. We're going to just have that there. <clears throat> I want to talk to you about the stages of childhood this morning. And I'm, I'm going to try to bring some, some things out about the word and deed, about how we teach our children and so forth, okay? But I want to talk to you first about the three stages of childhood, and we're, we're really only going to look at one today. And there are one, two, three, there are at least four mothers in the room, Okay. Uh, there are um, more women than that in the room. And so they generally have a better grasp of this than men. But I think even men are smart enough to know that there is a difference in, in, in Charlie, okay, and in Gigi. They're in two different stages of life. In fact, Gigi's about to go into the third, Gigi and Ada are about to go into the third stage of childhood. <laughs> Now, the fact of the matter is you have infancy to, to childhood. That is one thing. So you're really talking about, and th this is not set in stone, right? It doesn't say, okay, infancy ends at, 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 at five. This, this, this thing ends at five. No, some it may be earlier or later, but you know that, that those first few years of life, which we're going to just refer to as infancy, and then you have childhood. They're a little different. They're a little bigger. They can do a lot, uh, you know, many more things. And then you have teenagers, okay? Now, from infancy to childhood is the most, I think it's the most dramatic of all the pre-adult life stages, okay? Now, think of the, the, primary, the, the primary characteristic of that stage is what? You tell me. What's the primary characteristic of zero to four or five? Uh, it is not slobber. What did you say, Nick? Oh, I think it was Nick. Survival? Is that what you said? That's for the parents. I'm talking about the child. 
I think that's all the way through life, dear. I mean, really, I still push boundaries. Uh, uh, change is what I'm looking for. Change, okay? Think of it. Charlie is two and how many months? He's 18 months old. Oh, he's not two yet. He's 18 months old. Well, he's made so many changes in the last few months. Forgive me. It, which kind of bears my point, all right? Think of the physical changes. Think of Charlie since they've been coming to church. They've been coming to church here uh, nine months or more. A baby goes from, they can't hold their head up, they can't sit, they can't roll over, supposedly. I do have to say we had one roll over when they were a couple of days old, so that, that may vary. But <clears throat> uh, they, can't, uh, they can't sit, they can't stand, they can't do any of that. But in the course of those first few years, they go from they can't do anything to uh, physically to uh, walking, stand, uh, sitting, standing, toddling, walking, running, jumping, hopping on one foot, climbing trees. The, va the, the baby develops the, uh, the capacity to manipulate things. The first thing he generally does, if you look at Charlie, is put it in his mouth, okay? That's what all babies do. It's not just Charlie, all right? Charlie's providing a great backdrop for the lesson this morning. Uh, he learns to feed himself, open doors, uh, release latches. That's all the physical. That's not all of them, but that's kind of an idea. Any, any, anybody think of another change you think I need to mention physically in that period of what they can't do and what they can do in that period of time? Okay, so then you have social changes. Now, I think Nick will bear me out on this. With most children, the first few months of life, they only want the one who bear them, okay? It varies from child to child, but my second child didn't want anything to do with me for about the first year of life to the point that there were a couple of times Denise was in tears. You don't love him like you loved the first one. I said, he hates me, you know, I mean, I don't know what it is. All right. So socially, they go from just mom to they begin to broaden the circle to include dad and maybe siblings. And uh, they begin to learn to relate to others. Believe it or not, even a child Charlie's age is learning how to endear himself to you to make you like him, okay? Um, um, they learn how to seek approval. And by the time they are uh, Tyson and, and at Hattie's age, they begin to develop their own little circle of friends, okay? that is that. Those are some of the social changes that take place during those now, you, you'll figure out why I'm in. I know I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. But when we get to the end of this, you're going to find out why. Okay, I'm telling you these things. Then there's the intellectual change. <clears throat> this, too, is it's very dramatic. The child makes meanings of things. The child begins to interpret the rules of grammar. Even their childish little speech follows logical rules. You may... Hear a child say, I think this, as opposed to I thought this. But that, that follows the standard rule of adding ED, right? They say some cute things, and, and, and we don't, sometimes we don't want them to lose that baby talk, okay? Um, I, I recently heard Bailey say something about Hattie's speech, and I just kind of chuckled because I remembered when uh, Emma used to never call Nathan Nathan, she called him Vaven. And we were kind of sad when she called him Nathan. We we're like, oh no, she's growing up, you know. And and Nathan, Nathan used to say, instead, you know, when you're when you're correcting a child, you may say, "Do you understand me?" And Nathan would always say, "Understand me, understand me," you know. And so when he stopped and said, "Yes, I understand," oh, it was kind of a sad moment, right? But they begin to interpret the rules of grammar and get a hold to it. Uh, curiosity uh, abounds. Uh, why is the sky blue? Why is the thunder loud? Why is the grass green? Well, why is it now brown if you live in Texas, right? Uh, why do things fall to the ground? Uh, they learn to talk, to count, to tease, to be funny, to be serious. They learn to place importance upon things, okay? I know CJ, I shouldn't call his name, but I've already done it now. CJ, man, he was just busy, okay? And when we were in West Africa, he knocked over. Denise had one of those curio things that hangs on the wall, and she had all these 
pretty much irreplaceable, older, precious moments, things on there. And CJ actually came by, him and the bow were running, doing whatever, and he knocked that off, and every one of them were broken, if I remember correctly. And there were times when, I don't remember if it was this particular time, I could be confusing two stories, but he knew he messed up. He knew those were important to mom. And there were times when something like that would happen, whether it's this time or another, I can't recall. He would go run and hide under the bed because he knew oh, that was important to mom and I broke it. You know, I mean, he would just, they, they learn what's important to us. Okay. Now, you probably hadn't thought of this one. But just like the other three areas, there are spiritual changes in those few years, okay? They're developing spiritually. I'm not going to try to explain this to you, but I'm just going to explain to you, just like you shepherd their physical change, just like you shepherd their so social change, just like you try to help them shepherd that, that uh, intellectual change, we have to help them shepherd that spiritual change in those first few years. Um, I try not to disrespect people of other religions, but there are other religions that, that just to leave it at short, are very unbiblical. They, they may name the name of Christ, but they do not follow the scriptures at all. Okay, They may quote some at Christmas or Easter or whatever, but other than that, they pretty much do their own thing. And they will tell you, you give me a child till he's five, he'll be ours till he dies, okay? Those first five years are terribly important. Uh, well, I messed up. God can help you overcome that, but I need you to know that it is important to start early. Now, most of us think that a child of that age doesn't understand much. I am thankful. Hmm, help me, Lord, not to cry. I'm thankful that when each of my children were born, my pastor or myself held them up in the hospital and gave them the gospel. You say, well, they couldn't respond. No, but I wanted them to hear it from day one. Jesus loved you so much. You, you, it's hard to tell it now, baby, but you're a little sinner and you're going to need his salvation. I have a relative whose children have left the faith and gone to another faith. And, and they texted me yesterday to say, look, before you hear it from somebody else, we took part in this yesterday. But we want to keep the lines open so that we can have a relationship with our grandchildren so that we can give them the true gospel when the Lord opens that door. It's important that we start to teach right now. And again, a lot of people think, well, they, they can't get it at their age. Let me tell you a story. I, I read it, it's not my story, okay? But I read of a man whose son had a traumatic brain injury. Now I would think the crowd I'm looking at, uh, being associated with the military, understands a TBI can really affect your abilities to do, to walk, to talk, to have any sort of interaction. interaction. I have a friend who's, uh, uh, I should call him an acquaintance. I hadn't talked to him in 20 years, but I have an acquaintance who's who had twin girls and they were both perfect. And he, he, was, he is a speaker and he traveled a lot. And in some church where he was preaching a revival, somebody in the nursery dropped his baby. Okay. Nobody knew it. That's the only thing they can come up with because they were identically perfect. And both of them were advancing. They were a few months old. And now that one child, I believe she's now passed away. She would be approaching 40 if she were still living. And I think she passed away a few years ago. But she spent most of her life in a home because it was just more than mom and dad could do to, to take care of her once she got to a certain stage. Even though they were born at the same time, they were advancing at the same pace and so forth, the one child... No communication whatsoever. Can't do it. Can't walk, can't talk, can't do any of that. Obviously, this traumatic brain injury I'm going to talk to, to you about is not that bad. I mean, we have people in the church, I'm not going to tell you who they are, who've had a TBI, and they, they're doing very well. God has really blessed them, okay? 
But anyway, so this man's son had a traumatic brain injury as a child, and he didn't know how much the child could get, but he and his wife followed the lines of what we've been teaching, teaching their child right, wrong, God, God's authority, sin and salvation, those things. They modeled this by praying before the meals, praying before bed, praying over difficulties. At age three and a half, the boy still couldn't, had not uttered his first word, okay? And on one particular day, the dad knew he had to discipline his son over an action. But the dad was very conflicted because he didn't know how much the son could get, how much he could understand. And yet, no matter how little they understand, you have to teach them not a discussion, but this is right, this is wrong, you can't do this, all right? But the son, TBI and all, could see the stress his father was under. His first words were, pray, Daddy. I don't care how smart or how you think your child might be unintelligent, they can get what? Now, I've never met a person who thinks their zero to five is unintelligent. Most of us think they're going to be a genius at that age, right? They're going to they're gonna solve everything because that, that we think it. <clears throat> The son had grasp enough to know that, that the Lord would help his father in a time of need. So don't write it off that, uh, well, they're, 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 they're too young. Some, some people, honestly, do not start to discipline their children until they're five or six years old. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be gracious in my speech, but honestly, you are... If, if that is someone's mentality, they are creating more work than they can imagine to try to bring that child back to center mass, okay? We have to teach them, even in the first stage of life, that they are moral beings and they are under the authority of the parents and under the authority of a providential God. They need to learn to honor and obey they experience at least part of the promise in Ephesians 6 and Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 and Colossians 3 when they honor and obey. By implication, if they are outside the circle of obedience, they are causing themselves to, to not to receive the blessings of the promise and possibly to receive some sort of, of curse. Now, when, when our children were very small, two older children were very small, we knew we were moving to an area where there were multiple creatures who could take their life, okay? If they got away from me, they could lose their life. And so before we went, for like a year before we went to West Africa, I mean, they have crocodiles, they have, I forget if it's the black mamba or the green mamba, but both of them will kill you, okay? They have cobras, they have monitor lizards, they have lions. Tigers are in India, okay? Don't get confused. But they have hyenas, they have all kind of stuff, okay? So we played what we called the obedience game. Now, I don't know why the Lord's moving me to tell you this story, but basically, we, it's kind of like Simon says. And if I say drop, you drop right where you are. If I say stop, you stop right where you are. If I say come back five steps, you come back five steps immediately. Too often, we train our children to argue with us, okay? There is a place for an appeal, and I'm going to cover that in just a second. But children, especially during those first five years, children need to learn to honor, which is doing what you're told, when you're told, with the right attitude. Honor and obey are not exactly synonyms, but they're pretty pretty close. Another way uh, to say that is without argument and without delay uh, <clears throat> and so forth. But discipline takes an erring child and puts them back in that circle of protection and blessing. Uh, parents are honored and esteemed, or we should be honored and esteemed, because of our position of authority. Now, I'm going to tell you, in our culture, that's very difficult to teach. I have seen, I have seen specialist uh, Mike talk to senior NCOs in a method I, I could never 
imagine myself as a corporal in the United States Marine Corps speaking to an E-5, let alone an E-6 or 7, the way I've seen people speak, okay? Uh, we see this all kinds of ways. We see, I, I have corrected a few children here in the church, call me John. With all due respect, I'm the pastor. A two-year-old needs to call me as close as he can get to pastor, preacher, brother John, something. There needs to be some respect. You need to have that respect with your children. They don't need to call you by your first name. They certainly do not need to speak to you with imperatives. Give me that. Fix me something to eat. This is totally inappropriate. Uh, children do not command parents with imperatives. Parents can discuss kind of with one another what your protocol is going to be. Because the fact is, it's going to happen. Okay. It's not, oh, well, I'm raising my kids right. They're never going to talk to me that way. They are little sinners. It will happen. Okay. Just like you're a big sinner, they're a little sinner, and it's going to happen. So you have to kind of decide a protocol, step one, step two, step three. Let me just give you some ideas of things that can be said when a, when a child speaks to you inappropriately, whether it be giving you a command or calling you by your first name or whatever. You could say, you don't have to be read, rude, and you don't have to go immediately to, to some sort of uh, timeout or physical discipline of some kind, right? Uh, you can say, I'm sorry, dear, but you can't speak to me that way. God made me your father. Or if it were Denise or Bailey, God made me your mother, which means you must honor me. So let's try that statement again with respect. That's one way you could handle it. A second way you can handle it is, hey, I'm not one of your buddies, boy. Now, you may not call your boys boy, but that's what I called mine. It's what my daddy called me. It's a term of endearment, but depending upon how it is inflected, they also know it's a serious tone, okay? You may flippantly speak to your buddies in such a manner, but you may never speak to your father in such a manner. You make requests, I give orders, okay? Now, Bailey playfully, shh, when I said that Gigi and Ada were about to go into the next step of life, you tell me, I've used the term in your presence before. I got to come in for a landing pretty quick here, here. But what do people call teenagers often today? Monsters, he said. What'd you say? Terror. Terrors. I've heard the term meanager. Anybody ever heard that besides me? Meanager. You know when meanagers, when terrors, when monsters are created? Between Charlie and Hattie. You are creating, when a child is small, what you're going to get when they're a teenager. You reap what you sow, you reap more than you sow, and it takes a while. Okay? So it's important to handle these things when they are small. Some kids may make a joke of an imperative. When, in other words, when mom and dad says, hey, I need you to clean your room, they may, they may make a joke. Now, I'm going to tell you, you see a lot of reels about this. I'm trying to come in for a landing, but you see a lot of reels about this where people are destroying PlayStations and throwing TVs out the window. You know, it's your pocketbook. You don't necessarily have to do that. I have thrown toys out the window. I have, okay. But I have also taken it when, my, when Denise said, hey, that one costs too much, you know. I have taken it and put it in the closet for some time. You don't have to throw it away, but you do have to handle that. But sometimes kids will make a joke out of it. And, you know, you may hear a mom or a dad say, I need you to be serious. They're probably more serious than you realize. They're just delaying what you've asked them to do. Don't train them to delay it until, you, here's what we do. We tell them something to do and they kind of joke, play, whatever, annoy, ignore us, whatever the case may be. And then we tell them here, and they kind of keep joking and play. And then we tell them here, and then they go, oh, no, it's serious now. I got to go. And what we're doing when we wait till the third time to get serious about it is we're training them to wait till we get to that decibel. Demand the obedience on the first command. That's over. If, if the obedience is not given at first command, it's not obedience, Okay. Without challenge, without excuse, without delay. This is obedience. Now, in today's world, you got to be ready to swim upstream. This is not a walk in the park, all right? 
uh, it's, it's hard work and children will almost certainly challenge you. And I'm going to be frank with you, especially the firstborn and probably the second of any gender. I know there are multiple, you know, parents with multiple age children here. At the same time that we need to demand obedience, we need to make room for appeal. Okay. What is appeal? You tell me quickly. We got to come in for a landing. Appeal. Joe, I'd really like a parent to tell me. I appreciate your, your attendant, attention. What did you say? <coughs> a counter argument. What were you going to say, Josh? Yeah. Same thing. Okay. So sometimes it's okay to have a counter argument from the child. The idea, though, is how do they present it? First step, example. Hey, your, your, your least one is, is, is Evelyn. So she's what? Five? Six. So Evelyn's coloring a picture. You tell Evelyn to go to bed. Evelyn's first step should be, yes, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, whatever you demand at your house, and head to bed. But if she's almost done with the picture, it's okay to go, Mom, I know it's time for bed, but, but you know, as she's going to the, to the bedroom, would it be okay if I finished the picture? But then... Part of the appeal process is she needs to be ready to obey whether mom says, yeah, that'll be fine. Finish the picture and then you can go to bed. Or whether mom says, no, you really got to go on to bed now. And we shouldn't have to. They are six. They are eight. They are 12. We should not have to have a 20-minute debate explaining our logic. You are the parent. They are the child. They should respond to what you say. And they really should respond joyfully because they know you love them. OK, in other words, the result of the appeal, whether it's yes or no, it should be accepted graciously by the child. Now, the, 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 I'm, I'm going to tell you this. I'll tell you, this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put this away and then I'm going to tell you this quickly and we're going to stop in two minutes or less. Mom and dad are supposed to model these things to our children. Now, I know it's not politically correct, but that means mom needs to submit to, to dad, okay? That also means dad. You notice I went ahead and read all of the section in Colossians. Dad has to submit to his boss. We might say to God, to government, to his boss, et cetera, and so forth. There are exceptions to any of those except God, but um, we need to model this. And there are so many things in society that have crippled us in that. The quote-unquote liberation movement, okay? Uh, don't shoot me. Unions. All of these things have taken away the biblical idea of submission to authority. So it's kind of the monkey is on our back to not only... Um, Teach them submission to authority, but they need to see it in our case. We need to, even in parenting, as we've covered before, I'll say this, and then I promise I'm closing in prayer. We need to, them to understand that we are parenting because we are submitting to God's authority. This is why we do what we do. And so then you are, whether you're mom or dad, you are modeling the obedience and the honor, because you're doing what God told you to do in teaching them to do what God tells them to do. Uh, okay, so I'm going to shut up there. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that have gathered out here today. We do pray that this simple lesson was a blessing. I pray that.